is Tuesday, May 21st. This is the Christian Commute. I am your host, Seth Dunn, and I'm just going home. I'm not going to the baseball fields. I'm not going to the soccer pitch. You know that. Soccer is called a pitch, not a field. I'm not going anywhere but my house because sports are over and it's almost time for summer. And... Speaking of sports, that's why we didn't have a show on Friday. They had the championship game for Little League, and it was at 5.45, so I just I didn't even try to come to work. I just stayed home and worked, and that's why there was no commute on Friday. Unfortunately, my son's team lost, and my son himself, who is not a pitcher, took the loss. He came in with bases loaded <laughs> and a tie game with one out when we were out of pitchers and they walked it off on him but at least he threw strikes so we lost then we went to a tournament this weekend and lost and now it's a soccer tournament not baseball but now everything's over and we're having a relaxing off season I'm just going you know what I'm just going to go home and watch a movie maybe Maybe I'll watch Jeopardy. No, it's 7.30. I'm not watching Jeopardy. I, I, look at me. I'm in the office at 7.30 because I don't have anything anywhere to go. So we're back on track on the Christian commute. I'll probably actually be coming to work more than usual. So we should have more shows until I go on vacation twice in July. But that's where we are. And I'm in the white van, and I've got the headset, and I've got a full show. Here comes the yawn. I got a full show for you today. Today's show topic is the weight. Do I want to call it the weight? The burden? I'm going to tell you. Let me just tell you what I'm going to talk about. And by the way, I made this show topic right before I left work at 7.20. I was like, what can I talk about today? I'm going to talk about bivocational and vocational pastors. And I'm going to talk about vocational pastors and I don't want to say the disadvantage of having a vocational pastor because I don't think it's a disadvantage. So when I say the weight or the burden, I don't mean the weight or the burden on the man's shoulders. I mean the cost burden on the church to have a vocational pastor. That's what I'm going to talk about. So, I don't have to. I'm sorry, I'm yawning. I don't have to come up with a show topic now. I'll just come up with one when I upload the show. And I'm still lazily uploading the show from my phone. That's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about all the things that come with a vocational pastor. And this show topic is inspired by my question. I have but one question in the inbox. And it's about pastoral sabbaticals. I need a sabbatical. (sighs) Because I'm sleepy all of a sudden. I don't know why. You know, usually... If I listen to the show, I'll put myself to sleep. But apparently, just giving the show now puts me to sleep. And as always, we have the Bible chapter review. Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 69. Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 69. This is yawn. This is unworkable. My wife's gonna get mad if I get get home at eight thirty and go straight to bed. I won't. I won't do that. I'm gonna eat first, then I'm gonna go straight to bed. (laughs) That's not gonna go well for me. Zacharias's tongue has been loosed. He's finally able to speak again after he names John. And then, right after this, starting in verse sixty-seven. He's going to begin to prophesy. So the scripture... Oh, I should give up. I can't even get through it. I'm so sorry. 
And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be... I'm not yawning, I just had to turn. I usually read it at the red light. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and, and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David his servant. Now I'm going to cut it off right there because I don't have enough sticky note room for this whole prophecy. This prophecy is several several verses long. Hey John, John asked a question about when do preachers get sabbaticals. I think it was when they start yawning during, during the sermon. I think that's what it is. But this prophecy is several verses long. I'm just going to cover the first four lines of it. It's in sort of a poetic form. You might say I'm covering the first few stanzas. But since Luke says Zacharias is filled with the Holy Spirit, we have to take his words as inspired by God. Now, you might be saying, Seth, aren't all the words in the Bible inspired by God? Yes, the words are, but sometimes somebody in the Bible could be saying something that's wrong. The wrong statements of the person in the Bible speaking would not be inerrant. It would be the Bible, it'd be, the inerrancy is, and an inspiration is that the dude really said it. So, yes, Luke is inspired scripture, and the inerrancy and inspiration is that Zac Zacchaeus really said, or Zacharias really said these things, and, and when he said them, and who he said them to, and how he said them, this is all accurate, okay? But he's filled with the Holy Spirit. So his prophecy is authoritative. This is an authoritative prophecy that we're getting here. Let me pass this pickup truck. Going a little too slow. So Zacharias filled with the Holy Spirit after God miraculously made him mute. He is now miraculously filled with the Holy Spirit. And in response to the birth of his son John... He blesses God. The first thing he does is blesses, blesses God. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. So he recognizes the greatness of God in his prophecy. It is the Lord God of Israel who is doing something for his people. But that's exactly it. It's for his people. God is doing something for his own people here. The Lord God of Israel is doing what? Visited. He's visited them. What does that mean? John is a... John the baby being born is a special baby. He's He is essentially a prophet. Although he's a little baby. He hadn't prophesied anything yet. But remember, what's... God remembers. That's what we remember. God... Is, God is graceful and God remembers. Remember the name, what the name of Zacharias and the name of John means. We've been talking about that. So God has remembered his people. God has remembered his people. And the visit that he's talking about there is John coming. And we know John's going to be the herald of Jesus. It is part of God's redemption plan for Israel. So he says he's accomplished the redemption for his people first by sending John, as later as we'll find out, by sending Jesus. And remember, the mother of the Messiah has already been to John or to Zacharias' house. And Elizabeth has already recognized what was visited upon her because the baby leaps. The baby is filled with the Holy Spirit and leaps in the womb. So Zacharias is not entirely ignorant of what's going on with Jesus and John here. He would have some idea. And of course now he's filled with the Holy Spirit. So there is a plan in action 
for the redemption of God's people who God has remembered. He has raised up a horn of salvation. Now, horn of salvation is just figuratively speaking. We don't talk like this, a horn of salvation. N nobody in modern times would talk like this because we don't go around blowing horns and we don't have an altar anymore. But the altar at that time would have had horns on it and it, those symbolize refuge and safety. You can Google that for more if you want. He's raised up a horn of salvation and where? In the house of David, his servant. There's still something going on here with the line of David. And with that, I'll end the Bible chapter review before I yawn again. I barely made it. I've been really sleepy and really hungry later. I think there might be something off with my thyroid. I might need a different dose of thyroid medicine. Because when it's off, I get real tired and voraciously hungry. I've been taking my medicine. But sometimes I wake up really early and I'm like, oh, I better take my medicine. And then I go back to sleep and I wake up and I'm like, did I take my medicine? I don't know. I'm going to take it again. So maybe I took too much. We'll see what the thyroid doctor says when I go visit her. All right, now it's time for a question in the inbox. A question in the inbox. Ooh. Oh, and there's a sneaky Gordon County Sheriff's deputy hiding in the bushes. That's why traffic was so slow. All right. Sneaky deputy. Here's a question in the inbox. It's from John in the great frozen north of Canada from my truck driver demographic. Here is his question. And by the way, if you have a question about Christian theology or apologetics, you can write to SethDunn88 at gmail.com. SethDunn88 at gmail.com. By the way, this, this isn't really a question about theology, but it sort of is. John asked, why do pastors seem to need a sabbatical? Every seven to ten years, some pastors, by the way, John, get a sabbatical uh, every four or five years. And if a church is giving a pastor a sabbatical, they're going to make up some theological reason for it. But is there a theological reason to give a pastor a sabbatical? I don't think so. But let's talk about this. Who here listening every once in a while, like every few years, just gets a whole month off from his job? Any of you out there just get a whole month off? I didn't think so. Now, if you've been working long enough at the same job, you might have four weeks of vacation. Sort of, I don't know how it is in the great frozen north of socialist Canada, John, but in the United States, usually when you start, you get two weeks of vacation. And if you work at a place for five years you get another week of vacation and if you were if you have 10 years of service time they'll give you yet another week of vacation so four weeks of vacation is a is a month and when i left field turf i, I was eight years i was two months away from having four months of vacation i started at my current job with three weeks i think i have three weeks of vacation yeah i have three weeks and i don't know when the next week will trigger I know this, I can't take a whole month off at once. Like, I have three weeks of vacation right now. But there's no way that I could just take three weeks off and keep up with the things I need to do for my job. So usually I take it of a couple days or a week at a time. Maybe I might take two weeks vacation, but usually I just take it a week at a time. And I think that's the same for everybody. So even those of us in the rarefied air of upper management who have three and four or even five weeks of vacation, we do not take all that vacation at once. But in pastor world, things are different. Things are different. And it is not uncommon for a pastor to have as a part of his compensation package, the agreed upon compensation package with the church 
with whom he's employed to have a sabbatical. Now, some, time, some big shot, big time pastors, they just get a sabbatical every year. When uh, jo- Johnny Hunt, the scoundrel Johnny Hunt, was at the First Baptist Woodstock, he used to take four Sundays off in summertime, and he'd just go to Panama City Beach. And nobody would notice because it was like, it's time for the summer series. And they'd bring in the big-time all-stars of preaching like Paige, Bas- Paige Patterson or Robbie Gallaty. And it's the summer preaching series. But really, like, don't you, haven't you noticed the pastor ain't been here for a month? So depending on how big time you are, you might get a sabbatical every year. You might just get the whole month of July off. Now in the mega churches, the guy the, gets the the mega pastor gets the sabbatical in summer because attendance is low in the summer, and they don't need the golden tongued mega pastor to preach to the half and three quarter full crowd while everybody's gone on vacation. So that's why they, I think that's why they do that. But even you got your mid sized churches will give the pastor a sabbatical, maybe a month, maybe two months leave every few years. And the idea is that, you know, he needs to refresh. He's been at work. He's in the care of souls. He's under more stress than the rest of you work a day stiffs. I think that's the idea. Now, we see all kinds of Sabbaths in the Old Testament. There's the Sabbath day, of course, that's baked into the creation order and baked into how we keep time and one day a week. But, there, I mean, there were Sabbath festivals and Sabbath years. There's a lot of Sabbath stuff. And, by the way, Shabbat, that's, where we, that's the Hebrew word, Shabbat, for rest, Sabbath. That's where we get our English word for sabbatical. And it's usually in academia that you'll find people having a sabbatical. So professors will be given a sabbatical, and they're paid, but they're not at work teaching classes. And the reason that professors get sabbaticals is so they have time to publish and do research. So at what is called a quote-unquote research university, think of the University of Georgia, for those of you here in Georgia. The professors are expected to contribute to their field. They don't just get their doctorate and stop researching and stop learning. No, they're expected to contribute by writing articles and even textbooks and academic works and being published. And when are they going to find time to do this? Well, that's why they have sabbaticals to do the lion's share of that work right? because they you know they're not going to be lecturing and keeping office hours and grading papers think about a professor who has three lectures a day there are three one hour lectures it's three hours well what is he doing for the rest of the day well he's in office he's in his office hours who who in the world uses office hours i think i used office hours twice in my whole college career and that was for calculus because as Barbie says, math is hard. And by hard, I mean it doesn't just automatically come to me like everything else does. I actually have to study math. That's why it's hard for me. Anyway, I used office hours. But for the most part, nobody uses the office hours. But the professor has to sit there in the office. What do they do all day? Well, they're supposed to be researching and contributing to their field. But eventually, they need time away from teaching classes and they take a break, they get a sabbatical, but they're not just resting, they're researching. They may be traveling, going to some library on the other side of the world to see a book that only that library has. Uh, These days are gone because now everything's digitized. But used to be, you might have to travel to go to a library that has a a rare book that that some other library doesn't have. And you couldn't just sit and, and use the computer to do all your research. But that's why, that's why professors get sabbaticals. But now pastors get a sabbatical. We're going to have a sabbatical pastor. Well, why? Why can't he just take two weeks, three weeks of vacation like everybody else? Somebody might say, well, he works on Sunday. He doesn't, 
you know, get two days off like everybody else does. And that's wrong. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to call it an industry, but in the pastor industry, we'll say the, how about the vocation of minister ministry? For vocational ministers, they get Friday off or maybe a half day Friday. Call a church office on Friday. Nobody's there. That's the day they take off. They take off Friday and Saturday because they have to quote unquote work on Sunday because they have to show up and give the sermon and do the music. So th think about like a hairdresser. People get their hair cut on Saturday because they're off of work. Hairdressers work on Saturday. Restaurateurs work on Saturday. If somebody owns a restaurant, like a mom and pop shop, they're working on Saturday. What day do the restaurateurs and hairdressers not work? Monday. So uh, if you're a hairdresser or a, or a restaurateur, somebody in the service industry, you take off Sunday and Monday. It's different from somebody in, say, the factory or production industry like I'm in because we take off Saturday and Sunday. Well, if you're in the ministry vocation or ministry industry, and I've, I think I've mentioned this on the show before, you really you can't take off Sunday. You have to go in there and preach. So what day do you take off? Friday and Saturday. So it's not like they're working six days a week. They're not. But if you're a pastor, you are, in a sense, on call. If somebody is dying in the hospital, it's, I'm sorry, it's not 9 to 5 between Monday and Friday. You know, it would be really great if you could die at 3 o'clock on a Tuesday. I'd be there. But since it's Saturday night at 7 p.m., <laughs> I'm, I'm going to let you die alone. That's not how it works. If there's a wedding or a funeral or something like that going on, the pastor's probably involved. Now, when you get to these big churches with a bunch of staff people, like if if you go to First Baptist Woodstock, Jeremy Morton ain't doing your wedding. I mean, he might, but you know what I mean. Like it ain't it, at a mega church. The big pastor, the, the senior pastor's not doing all the weddings and doing all the funerals. It's broken up between the staff. But it's your mid-sized church. You gotta understand that if, if the pastor's having to go do stuff sometimes out of what we'd call office hours. And the more he has to do that, the more apt the personnel committee is to give him a sabbatical. Let me give you an example of a sabbatical that wasn't a regular, regularly scheduled sabbatical that a friend of mine got. So a few years ago when Jeremy Morton, who's now the first pastor of First Baptist Woodstock, when he replaced Johnny, Johnny Hunt, the scoundrel Johnny Hunt at First Baptist Woodstock, First Baptist Carswell didn't have a pastor. A quote unquote senior pastor. There were plenty of pastors on staff. They were not, they did not have a pastor, but they didn't have a senior pastor. So the guy who took the reins was Drew. Drew's startup. His dad happens to be a music pastor, fun fact. Um, and I, I don't know what Drew's title was at First Baptist, discipleship minister, something like that. And so he was responsible for the day to day stuff that the senior pastor was doing and that included some preaching he wasn't doing all the preaching but he was doing some of it so as soon as they hired a senior pastor about two weeks later drew got a sabbatical they gave him a they gave him a month off why because he'd been doing his work and somebody else's work so they they said here take some time off you need to rest and he did he was you could you could see he was tired So he needed that time off. So sometimes, think of how stressful spiritually shepherding people can be. It is a burden. It is waiting. If there's some period where there is a lot of shepherding and little rest going on, it's probably a good idea to give a pastor a sabbatical. Now, baking it into a compensation package, I don't see any biblical mandate for that. I don't know why you'd make a pastor take time off. Like, or it's like, you got to. Like, if you work in banking, they make you take time off. And while you're gone, the auditors come and make sure you're not stealing. But I don't think that's why pastors are given these sabbaticals. I think it's just some kind of perk that's given to the man of God in a lot of places. I, I really don't see any biblical warrant 
And I don't, it's, I don't, it's probably one of the, the, the New Testament's full of epistles, and epistles are occasional letters, and I guess there was just no occasion where the pastor was tired and needed a sabbatical when they were writing the New Testament. But I don't see any biblical foundation or warrant for baking a sabbatical into the compensation package for a pastor unless, unless he just doesn't have any vacation. Like, he just doesn't have vacation days. Like, if a pastor wants to go on vacation with his family, and he's like, well, I'm going to take this week off. Like, I'm not going to be there Sunday. I'm going to be in Jacksonville, Florida at the beach. Or I, I'm going to be at Yellowstone National Park hiking around. I'm not going to be there Sunday. But if a pastor doesn't have vacation days like that, maybe have a sabbatical time during the year, and that's the year that that's like the time he gets to take vacation. But again, that's really not a, not really a sabbatical, is it? More like a vacation, unless you just want to say that vacation is an, in is in and of itself a sabbatical, and we just don't call professional people. We don't call their vacation sabbaticals. But John, I, I don't know why I don't know why they do that other than to just give a perk to somebody. And listen, churches are well within their rights to do whatever they want to do, as long as it doesn't go against the Bible. But let's 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 use that to lead in to the show topic about vocational pastors. Now, I'm not saying a pastor should not get paid for his pastoring. He should not get what is sometimes called a remuneration for services. Because the Bible says, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading. The Bible says that the, uh, the elder is worthy of double honor. Okay. The pastor should absolutely be compensated for the time he spends pastoring the church because he could otherwise be engaging in another trade. But let me point this out. Let me ask you, the elders at your church, those elected dudes at your church, we call sometimes call them lay elders, when they have two hours of meetings every month, do they get any money for that? I bet most of the time the answer is no, they're not paid. And I think there's an inconsistency there. Like if, 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 if you have elders of a church and they're not on salary, but they're just the elders, the, the quote-unquote ruling elders or lay elders, that are just plain old church members, that are not W-2 salaried people, if, if, those, if those guys are spending five to six hours a month in eldering duties or pastoring duties, why are they not getting paid 20, 30 bucks an hour for that? Because if the Bible says they're truly worthy of double honor and we're not supposed to muzzle them while we're treading, why are they supposed to volunteer their time? So there's an incongruity there. But with a vocational pastor, that's something you get, is you get a full-time salary. The church is burdened with a full-time salary for every professional minister slash pastor that they hire. If you have a smaller church with a plurality of elders and maybe you have like or even if you just have one pastor who's bivocational a lot of times that guy's not pulling a lot of money there's not a lot of income coming in for a small church but there's actually that guy's not pulling in a salary he's not pulling in health care he's not pulling in the paid sabbatical time A lot of, in reality, a lot of these small bivocational pastors in the United States, they just have a housing allowance. It's a salary, but it's called a housing allowance, so it's not taxable. And you can get away with a housing, I mean, think of what a house costs a month, $1,000 times 12. You can get away with twelve, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year <coughs> calling that a housing allowance and not getting taxed and that... By get away with, I mean good. I don't want anybody paying income taxes. 
I, I don't I don't like that <clears throat> but as long as you have a pastor you're gonna have some kind of salary but if you have a bivocational pastor he's probably on the health plan at his office he's probably got vacation from his work and <clears throat> his job his secular job is what he depends on to make a living. And I think historically, that's the kind of pastors you would find. Before churches had a building and a mortgage and insurance and programs and etc., etc., etc. So now I think we show up to a church. And we expect there to be not just a pastor, but pastors, multiple full-time vocational pastors. And we've gotten to a place in the American church economy where something like 60% of church revenue is going to pay for pastoral salary. And then you got a big chunk of overhead for building. Whether it be the mortgage, the rent, and then the utilities, and I mean, guys, from an accounting standpoint, as a managerial accounting, a church building is the most inefficient asset you can think of. If you have a plant with machines in it that's open seven days a week, yep, the people are on shifts, they're not working seven days a week. It's always being used. If you have a Walmart, Walmart's always open, Wall House, always open. Okay, even stores that close, they're open five days a week, six days a week. Chick-fil-A is sitting there open six days a week. Sunday, the building isn't being used. But think of a, think of a church. It's the opposite. You're only using it one day a week. The rest of the time, the building sits there. And you're still paying interest on the mortgage. And you're still paying to keep it climate controlled. And I guess you're using it Wednesday, too. The church building just sits there. But listen, when people build buildings... We got to have a man to raise money for the building, and it's a vocational pastor. If you've ever, I don't know if they say this in the book, but if you've ever seen the movie Fight Club, there's a saying in it the things you own end up owning you. So the bigger your church gets in terms of assets, the more staff people you're going to have and vocational pastors you're going to have. And now you've got a guy who expects a sabbatical and a guy, if he leaves, he'll leave for another job in a heartbeat if it pays more and your church is going to have to replace him and you're going to go through a period of transition that could be difficult. And all of a sudden he wants a staff and he wants secretaries. So when I, get, when I talk about the burdens of having a vocational pastor, I'm talking about the burden on the finances of the congregation to entirely support someone's family. When it is not necessary to have a vocational pastor. Churches operated for years with bivocational pastors. And even churches in olden days, the pastor, well, he's the pastor. He's, he lives in, in a parsonage. But yeah, yeah, he's also a farmer. He's also got something going on on the side. But now there's been created this class of vocational pastors. And they're drawing full-time salaries. And they could have job skills to go out there and market themselves, <coughs> tent making, if you will, <coughs> where they wouldn't have to do that. So, yeah, there are advantages to having a vocational pastor. Consistent preaching, same guy there every week. Somebody's, he's always on call. He can manage a staff if your church needs a staff full of people. But you, you also need to ask yourself the question like, why, why are we spending so much money on something that's not necessary? And listen, I'm not trying to drive home in my old minivan here on the Christian commute and revolutionize the way church is done in America. But throughout the history of the church, worldwide, the model has not been some 
man of God with a full-time job and salary and benefits and vacation as a full-time pastor. It's been a plurality of elders at small churches with those guys working bivocationally <clears throat> and the church paying them back for the time they spend away from their vocation managing the church, shepherding the people. This is where we at, and I just want to say we don't really need to be here, do we? If you've got five lay elders at your church, and then you've probably got a senior pastor and associate pastor, you're going to ask yourself, can you do it with seven lay elders? Like, what are you, what are you doing? What are we spending all this money for? Is it just because there's an expectation? I want you to start counting the cost of the burden on your church of having a full-time pastor. Because I'm telling you, there's churches out there with bivocational pastors, and it, you know they're not falling apart. People ain't dying and go to hell, going to hell because of it. So may, maybe we'll call this consider a bivocational pastor. How about that? We'll say consider a bivocational pastor, or how about even better, consider bivocational pastors. That's what we'll title this. Because there's advantages and disadvantages. And you know, frankly, I think the advantages of a bivocational pastor outweigh the advantages of a vocational pastor. Somebody could convince me different, but it would have to take a lot of convincing. All right, that's it. Uh, I don't have any questions in the inbox for tomorrow. So please send one. I can do... to. I'm not going to do anything tomorrow because tomorrow's Wednesday and I'm not driving to work. But Thursday, Lord willing, I'll be back with you. And if I can't think of another exhilarating show topic, I'll do Article 12 of the Baptist Faith and Message. And, you know, I'm almost out of those. There's only 18 articles. So I'll get to that when I get to that. That's what's coming in the future. Thanks for listening to The Christian Commute. As always, God bless, and as always, remember Christianity is not about getting saved, it's about being saved.